Now, so what I was saying was that uh, uh, a whole lot of non-responders occurred. And these non-responders, since most of them had diabetes, were referred to me. And, and uh, as a result, being a systematic endocrinologist, I me measured their testosterones, prolactins, and so on. And I found that almost all of them had low testosterone concentrations. And with the low concentrations, they also had inappropriately low LH and FSH. So the basis of the concept of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism was established in type 2 diabetics. Next slide. Now, you can see in this slide that there is a increase in the uh, a decrease in free testosterone and total testosterone concentrations in the diabetic population. And the frequency of this was uh, uh, one third. So 33% of them were hypogonadal. And this then led to further investigations. Next slide. And when we looked at the correlations of testosterone concentrations, it was quite clear that there was an inverse relation with body weight or BMI, and that was true both of free and total testosterone. And since there was no correlation with HbA1c or with duration of diabetes, we thought then that there may be a reason why this is so, and that obesity itself may be a cause of hypogonadism. Next slide. And before, uh, go back. Don't jump, please. Can you go back? Yes. So when we found this difference, the next question we asked was, what happens in younger type 1, uh, younger diabetic patients, including those with type 2 and those with type 1? And it was quite clear that the low testosterone concentration was confined to patients with type 2 diabetes. So not only the middle-aged patients, who are the major part of my practice, but also children were involved in having hypogonadism. Next slide. And then we went on to do the next study, which was published in 2010. The first study was published in 2004, which started the whole story of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism type 2 diabetes. But then this slide shows you that even with simple obesity, there is a percentage of people with low testosterone concentrations. Again, you're jumping before I ask you to move. Can you go back? Yes, thank you. And in the diabetic population, you can see that the, the, the frequency is slightly higher. So remember the two key figures, 25% of non-diabetic obese and 33% of type 2 diabetics have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Next slide. This then took us to a younger population because clearly there are obese people in the younger population. And we looked at them. This is a paper published in 2013 and in which we compared the lean versus the obese. And you can see the differences in both total and free testosterone concentrations. So even pubertal obese males start off their life with low testosterone concentrations. And if their obesity continues on the basis of what I've shown you, they would continue to be hypogonadal. So keep this in mind. This is a very important area that young children who are obese could spend their lives being sexually inadequate and being also infertile. Next slide. And here is a cartoon, but I think it's sort of self-explanatory. Famous story, famous statue of Michelangelo's David in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. And if you ever go to Florence, you have to go and see the Uffizi Gallery, you know, which has 
sort of wonders from the Renaissance period. And this is a Renaissance creation. And you can see the beautiful male body of David as sculpted by Michelangelo. Now, on the right, you see that David made the mistake of coming to the United States for a few years, and he became obese. And you can see his tummy protruding. You can see his deltoids are gone, his the shrunken genitals. So this cartoon was published a year before our first paper in 2004. So I must congratulate the artist who made this cartoon because he's obviously observed that with obesity, there is shrunken, there are shrunken genitals. Next slide. And here is the next important observation. It was suggested to me originally that since obesity was associated with a low testosterone, and since adipose tissue produces estradiol, that this could be to excess estradiol in the circulation, which suppresses the axis, hypothalamic, uh, high, hypophysial axis, and that that may be the reason why you're getting hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. However, as is shown in the last slide, and again, you jumped, but it's okay now, uh, the, the estradiol concentrations were, were, were also low in these patients. So keep this in mind. Not only is the testosterone low, estradiol concentration is also low. So that cannot be the cause. So where is the cause? And this comes out from a study done in mice. This is the only animal study I'm going to be talking about. But this is a very important study done by Ron Kahn's group at Jocelyn Clinic, published in the year 2000, where they created a NERCO mouse. A NERCO mouse has no insulin receptor in the neurons. So basically then you got a brain. So... In the NERCO mouse, there is no insulin receptor and therefore there is an insulin receptor in the brain. And with it, you can see that the LH concentrations are low and the testosterone concentrations are low. And as you can see in this histology on the right side, the, these, uh, these animals have underdeveloped seminiferous tubules. So, so, so spermatogenesis is, is not adequate. And of course, they also have low testosterone. So clearly then, one of the reasons why, the major reason why there is hypogonadotropic hypogonadotropic obesity is due to insulin resistance in the brain. Next slide. And then that takes us to the next issue, that along with this obesity state, where we had already demonstrated that there is inflammation, you can see that in the hypogonadal population, the concentration of C-reactive protein was significantly higher, almost twice as high as that in the patient, I mean, in the, in the people, males with normal concentrations of free testosterone. Next slide. Please go back. Yes. Now. The next issue, and this is a very important part of my talk now, we are beginning to talk about the mechanisms involved following the existence of, uh, with the existence of the hypogonadal state in type 2 diabetes. So this was a large NIH funded study that we carried out. And clearly we had demonstrated that there was a level of insulin resistance done, proved through HOMA IR and through the euglycemic hyperinsulinemic uh, clamp uh, studies. And having demonstrated that, then we looked at the expression of the genes in the insulin sense signal transduction area. And you can see insulin receptor, beta subunit, expression is down in the hypogonadals. IRS, insulin receptor substrate, is down in hypogonadals. AKT2, which is a kinase that stimulates GLUT4, the glucose transporter is down, and the GLUT4, the glucose transporter itself is down. 
so that there is a four levels a an element that is interfering interfering with insulin uh, action next slide and along with it another pathway that was very interesting that was also inhibited in the hypogonadal um, uh, males was that the expression of AMP kinase, which mediates glucose uptake through exercise and metformin, was also diminished. So not only was the insulin signal transduction inhibited, in addition, there was an inhibition of uh, uh, AMP kinase as well. Next slide. Now, this then led us to carry out a study on testosterone replacement. And this study was carried out over a period of nearly half a year, so around 23 weeks. And you can see that in the placebo arm, the testosterone concentrations remained low, steady, whereas in the testosterone treatment arm, the levels were restored to into the normal range. So let's see the effects. Next slide. And as a result, in these patients, overall weight did not change. The the uh, A1C did not change significantly. Lipids did not change significantly. Next slide. But total lean body mass, although the overall weight did not change, lean body mass increased significantly. Total fat mass re was reduced. Visceral fat was also reduced. And hepatic fat, there was a trend towards reduction, but it was not significant. Next slide. Go back one. You jumped here. And here are the, the glucose clamp, glucose insulin clamp data showing you that following the treatment with testosterone, the insulin sensitivity increased or resistance decreased. Next slide. And of course, again, the same point being made here that following testosterone, in insulin sensitivity increased. So clearly, testosterone is a metabolic hormone which increases insulin sensitivity. Next slide. And here you see plasma-free fatty acids fell, part of insulin sensitization process. Plasma leptin concentrations fell because of the reduction in the adipose tissue. And then all those four elements of insulin signal transduction that I talked to you about earlier, insulin receptor beta subunit, IRS1, AKT2, and GLUT4 also increased with testosterone, whereas with the placebo, there was no change. Next slide. And AMP kinase did the same. So that too increased. So clearly, there is evidence that insulin improves glucose uptake by the cells, increases insulin sensitivity, and it's a sort of comprehensive action on glycemic control. Next slide. Then, the, when the next question, the issue is that of inflammation. And you can see CRP concentrations falling TNF-alpha concentrations falling. Next slide. And here, then we ask ourselves the question whether with the state of obesity and low testosterone, androgen receptor uh, expression altered. And you can see even the androgen receptor expression was false. So you've got a double whammy. Not only is the testosterone low, its receptor expression is also low. So whatever testosterone you have will have an inadequate effect. And with it, we also demonstrated that estrogen receptor <coughs> expression was also lowered. And following testosterone treatment, all of them normalized, as you see in the right panel. Next slide. And then... Again, androgen receptors, and I, I think it's a repeat of the last one. Next, next, let's go on to the next slide. And in muscle too, similar situation as was observed with uh, adipose tissue 
and in mononuclear cells. So clearly, uh, there is a comprehensive metabolic effect of testosterone, not only on, uh, on uh, insulin sensitization, but on other factors. Then in addition, talking about muscle growth, we demonstrated for the first time that something called FDF2, fibro fibroblast growth factor two, incre increases significantly with testosterone. IGF-1, which is known to promote muscle growth, also increases with testosterone. Next slide. And then, um, again, you can see here the, the uh, uh, other element, that myostatin, which is an inhibitor of muscle growth, is suppressed by testosterone. So on the one hand, you have promotion of agents, or mediators that increase muscle growth. On the other, the inhibitors of muscle growth are suppressed. Next slide. And then next issue was that to do with the, we know all of us know that testosterone hypogonadism leads to anemia. So we looked at the mechanism underlying that. And of course, on the one hand, erythropoietin increased with testosterone and then a negative protein called hepcidin, which inhibits the, the transporters, transporter mechanisms of iron was suppressed. Next slide. So having shown you all of these comprehensive effects, basically I want to mention that testosterone should lose its isolated identity as a sex hormone only. It's a very comprehensive metabolic hormone. And here you will see a startling set of results in patients given testosterone for a period of uh, a mean of eight years, but ranging between six to 11 years. And you can see that, the, that, that when testosterone is given, the levels increase and the group that did not get testosterone, testosterone levels continued to fall. In the group that got testosterone, there's a progressive loss of adiposity and weight loss, as you can see in this slide. There is also, yeah, go, 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 go on. And uh, there is also an increase in insulin sensitivity. HOMA IR fell progressively through this period of 11 years. And clearly that means that insulin sensitivity increased consistent with the metabolic effects I'd shown you earlier. Next slide. And here, A1C in these patients fell over this period of time in green, whereas those patients who did not get uh, testosterone and had diabetes, A1C continued to increase. Next slide. No, go back, go back. That's a very important one. And here what you see is something really startling. And this is something we published about three years ago, demonstrating, as you see on the bar on the left, that 34% of the patients in that group of 200 diabetics who were treated with testosterone, diabetes went into remission. So that's very important. 91% achieved an A1C of less than 7% without significant change in their um, insulin or other anti-diabetic therapies. And 83% uh, achieved and it will see less than 6.5%. Next slide. And with it, survival. And this is very important, very, very important, that the survival in the two study groups was significantly different. In the red line, you see patients who were not treated with testosterone, and in the blue line, you see those who were treated. And with it, you can see now here, the causes, and of course, cardiovascular complications were significantly higher in the, in the non-treated group. So testosterone protected against myocardial infarction, stroke, etc. And of course, microvascular complications were also less common in the treated group. Next slide. And here is a study showing, about, showing the effect of testosterone in pre-diabetics. And you can see the reversal of the, the pre-diabetes and non-development 
of diabetes in this group. Next slide. And now this is a startling study on, uh, and we published this last year, from Teen Labs. Teen Labs was the very first study from United States <clears throat> looking at the effects of bariatric surgery on testosterone concentrations. And uh, it was looking at uh, all metabolic effects, but what we did was to look at the data retrospectively on testosterone. And you can see that with the bariatric surgery, yeah, the body weight fell. And of course, the peak body weight fall was at around two years. And with it, testosterone concentrations increased, peak again at two years. Sex hormone binding globulin concentrations also increased because as you know, in insulin resistant states, sex hormone binding globulin is low, but it increased. Next line. Oh, go back. And you can see free testosterone concentrations also peaked at two years or 24 months. Next line. And you can see that there was a correlation in the change in the total testosterone with the change in body weight. So clearly then, body weight is a major determinant of testosterone concentrations in a negative fashion. And here are, is a detailed sort of slide from that very teen lab study, where you can see that as you see in the yellow and orange lines, the body weight fall. So the overall mean fall is in the yellow line and the overall testosterone increase is in the blue line. And you can see the inverse relationship dynamically. Now, what is interesting about this slide is that in those patients who increase their weight, which you see in red or orange, the testosterone concentration fell again. So this is something to keep in mind that even after bariatric surgery, testosterone concentration is dependent upon obesity. And if obesity increases, testosterone concentrations will fall. So with this, I'd like to close my talk because we've wasted some time in the middle and I think I've overshot my time. Uh, <clears throat> but I just want to mention that following our studies, a gentleman called Witter, Dr. Witter in Adelaide in Australia, conducted a series of studies using 15, 14 nanomoles per liter or 400 um, nanograms per mL of uh, testosterone as a threshold rather than the definite hypogonadal levels that we used in our patients. And even at that level, testosterone replenishment resulted in insulin sensitization and fall in glucose levels in early diabetics. And they demonstrated a reversal of prediabetes to normality in those patients. So with that, I want to close my talk and thank you for your attention.